Uh, I hope everybody is well. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. Uh, a, a very warm welcome to this afternoon's webinar on digital society, life online in the shadows of Ireland's tech boom. When Aoife Barry, who will be known to many of you, will discuss her 2023 book, Social Capital, Life Online in the Shadow of Ireland's Tech Boom, published by HarperCollins. The book focuses on what Aoife discovered while interviewing people in Ireland about their online behaviour and how they have been treated online and what this illustrates about the regulatory and legal challenges facing both social media users and tech owners. I feel the book really holds together in a number of ways and it feels not just uh, like a tech book from which I learned a lot, but it also feels like a series of stories and kind of a snapshot in time of Irish society. So um, it's a book I really enjoyed spending time with and really happy that Aoife is going to discuss it with us today. <clears throat> discuss it with us today, excuse me. Eve is also going to discuss some of the developments since the book's publication. And we'll demonstrate how issues around social media and misinformation have only grown to, to an uncertain and troubling future for the internet. There are chapters on influence, hate and harm, truth and lies, tech in the city and more, and far more than we'll be able to cover in the space of a short hour. <clears throat> but on a personal note as well, this book feels very familiar for someone who kind of started school in the late 80s, 90s, before the internet was a thing. And then by the time I finished it, dial up internet and the kind of uh, the kind of the dawn of what we now know and feel so familiar. So the book really feels like kind of um, familiar to me, given my given my age and my life experience. Aoife is a freelance journalist and broadcaster. Her essays and fiction have been published by Banshee Journal, The Word and Visual Verse. And she's been broadcast on RTE's Sunday Miscellany, the, Sunday Miscellany, the soundtrack for many a Sunday morning. Aoife is former assistant news editor at the journal.ie, and her bylines include the Sunday Times, the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, the Business Post, the Journal, and the Irish Examiner. Aoife features regularly on RTE and Today FM, and has received the Gillity Award funding from the Arts Council for a novel in progress, and was selected by the Irish Writers' Centre for its Evolution Programme 2023. Aoife, it's a real pleasure to have you here, and the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Barry, and thanks so much to everybody uh, that's giving up an hour of their day to listen to me talk um, about my book. I'm just going to share a slideshow that I hope um, will keep people's attention as well as uh, you having to listen to me for the next hour or so. Hopefully, um, you can all see that there. I'm actually just going to go um, close that and just go back to the very start with there now, uh, before I can start talking. Um, but like I said, this, um, like I was saying, this particular book was came out in 2023 and I just wanted to start um at the start of this by talking about kind of going back to the very beginning of the internet so let me just share at the start of the slideshow now which I have just rapidly pulled together for you um so can, hopefully we can all see this sorry oh my gosh speaking of uh talking about the internet <laughs> uh, it's sometimes sometimes fails us <laughs> here we go yeah. I think they put those two buttons too close together um, so I'm going to be talking about my book, Social Capital, uh, backwards here on your screen, came in 2023 and was nominated for an Irish Book Award, which was a real honour. So I think starting um, talking about social media and the impact of social media and the people I talk to in the book, you have to start really at the very beginning in terms of the internet and social media and where it all began. So very briefly, I think if we could all get ourselves situated back in the days that some of us will be familiar with. Um, I know I'm very familiar with it, but some people watching won't be. And that's that idea of, you know, the dialing in days or the dialing up to the internet days when you chose to go onto the internet, when you went into your kitchen, as it was in, in my house in Cork growing up um, in, in the late 90s, or maybe it was in, you were lucky to have a, a computer in your bedroom and your parents weren't keeping an eye on what you were up to, or maybe you had it in uh, the living room or something like that, and you were choosing to go on the internet. And so you probably remember at that time, seeing these sorts of things like chat rooms or the later early versions of what we now call social media, like myspace.com. Um, I used to spend a lot of time in chat rooms with my friends whenever I went online. And I was so fascinated by everything that I saw there. Um, a lot of the times because it was so kind of uh, transient and ephemeral, you know, I'd go on and I'd be on this random chat room. I usually just um, search on Alta Vista, which is Google didn't even exist back then, um, uh, for the words chat room and just find a random chat room and go talk to these people. It inevitably ended up being people from Australia or different countries that I knew I'd never talk to again for the rest of my life. There was something very appealing and interesting about that. So keeping in mind, I think that idea of we used to choose to go online, we used to choose to 
be in contact with people but it was very kind of ephemeral often um and moving then to say 2007 when the iphone came out and we suddenly had this explosion in smartphone ownership and that idea that now being online and being on social media is just a very normal part of your day that it's really easy to access the internet in fact it's really hard not to access the internet the complete opposite to what it was um you know 20 or so years ago so when I, you know, was young and a teenager, I didn't realize I'd end up working on the internet. And in 2011, I started writing for the journal.ie and eventually became assistant news editor there and a reporter. And so I saw social media grow and I saw its role and its importance in terms of how um, individuals interacted with it and how journalists interacted with it really grow. And I could see the importance of social media as a particular phenomenon culturally, which brings me to social capital, my book. So in 2021, during COVID, HarperCollins Ireland approached me and asked me, did I want to write about social media? So, of course, having spent a lot of time on it for the previous decade or, or more, I was really excited about writing about it. And they wanted to concentrate on Ireland and Ireland's story and how Irish people are impacted and have been impacted by social media. But it's such a huge thing, right? It's absolutely massive. They also wanted me to, to write a little bit about the impact in Ireland of things like Silicon Silicon Docks, you know, that area down in the Docklands that was regenerated thanks to Facebook and then other tech companies moving in. Whether or not you think that was a good thing or not, of course, you might agree or disagree with, with whether that was good. But that was also something that they wanted included. And I went home and I thought I'd love to write about this book, but I, I was trying to figure out how to write this. I knew that I had, you know, the background to write it, but I knew that I had to speak to other people. And so I turned to our Lord and Savior, Joan Didion, and I thought, okay, it has to be about telling people's stories, right? Um, it's a really famous quote um, from her book, the or collection, The White Album, where she says, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Now, that's very dramatic. And um, my book isn't necessarily about that, but it is about telling people's stories and finding the human stories, because I really feel that the only way you can talk about the impact of social media and the only way you can understand it is through talking to the people who use it. So I set off to do a number of interviews with people. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the interviews over the next little while, but I am going to talk to you about a couple of them. I'm also going to talk about um, a chapter that I wrote about myself and my experience, and then I'm going to move into the future um, of social media and the current challenges. So I'm going to try and cram a load of stuff into the next kind of 15 or so minutes. So um, with my very fast talking Cork accent. So please um, bear with me, but I hope that you glean some interesting things from these stories. The first um, is the protest. I opened the book with a story about these young people. There was a group of them. They came from Skull in Cork all the way to Leinster House because they were having serious issues with Facebook and Instagram and what they felt were the impacts of these platforms on their lives as young kids, young teenagers, mostly girls growing up in Cork, they felt we're seeing a lot of impact here. And we believe that the company Facebook needs to do something about the negative impacts on young people. And I was so impressed with them. And that's why I opened the book with them, because not only did they feel these things, they went all the way into all the way to Leinster House to, to try and talk to the minister, Catherine Martin, about it. And when I was a teenager, not only did I not have the internet in my life like they do now, and I didn't have those same pressures, but I probably couldn't have told you where Leinster House was, to be honest. I certainly wouldn't have known that I could have gone up there and protested outside it. And I just wouldn't have had the wherewithal to realize that as a young person, I could do that. And what that also ta taught me was that they are learning from people that they're seeing on social media. There's this positive impact. They're seeing Greta Thunberg starting her climate protests every Friday and not going to school and speaking to political figures globally. So it showed me that teenagers in particular are getting loads of great things from being online and loads of negative impacts too. And I felt those two threads were what were really carrying through the book. And so I opened it with their story. Now, as you can imagine, not a huge amount changed after they did that. And that's also a theme too. Like what is the actual impact of our protests um, or people's protests? But I still think it's really important for people to speak about their experience because change can only come after that. Um, here's a quote that some of the teenagers um, said to me. They basically said that, you know, Facebook was making so much money off its products that it's not going to stop or change what it's doing and that they felt it was up to the government to protect them. And it was just so impressive that they wanted to protect other young people as well as themselves in terms of the impact of social media as a whole. Another story that I tell in the book is the story of Coco's Law, which is legislation that came in um, in 2020. And this beautiful young girl in the photograph, um, her name is Nicole Fox, and she sadly took her life in around 2018. And her story is widely reported online. You can read more in the book as well. But her, I spoke to her mother, Jackie Fox, about her daughter, about her campaigning for this law. 
because her daughter was bullied in real life and she was also cyber bullied. And after her tragic death, her mother really saw there was a big gap there in terms of how people are, are taken to account for what happens to people online. So if you're cyber bullied, where do you go? Who can take care of you? Who can do anything about it? Um, and she did a lot of contacting different politicians and she ended up teaming up with the Labour TD, Brendan Howland, and he was drafting a bill at that time. And they really pushed forward for this. And luckily there was a big appetite for it or, or a certain appetite for it in government at the time. They met with the minister, Helen McEntee, and Jackie told her story and Coco's story. And in the end, this bill came out, the, um, this act came out, the Harassment, Harmful Communications and Related Offences Act, which covered cyberbullying, but also things, crimes that are really growing, like sharing intimate images without consent. And what was really big for Jackie was that it was given the subtitle of Coco's Law, which is the first time in Ireland that there's ever been a law that's had a person's name. You know, in the UK, that'd be fairly common, but we've never had it in Ireland before. And it really showed that link between the person and the fact that there are, you know, uh, to there's toxic behaviour and potentially crimes happening online too. Another story that I told is that of the Ryan family. I spoke to Fiona Ryan, who's there in the left in the photograph with her partner, Jonathan. And they weren't even really heavily on social media and were the recipients of very racist and toxic behavior because they appeared in a little ad with their son. And there was people on Twitter and Facebook and other platforms who were really unhappy with the fact that a multicultural family was pictured in little bil billboards and little ads. The company was little was really supportive of the family, uh, by the way, and they, they tweeted about it and they really showed their support. But for Fiona, she told me that she basically had to go and call to the Gardaí, ask them if there's anything that was could be done. And then the Gardaí said to her, you need to print out every single example you can find of the abuse online and hand them to us. And then we see what we can do. And in the end, nothing could be done. There was, I think really there was probably too many people involved and you know there wasn't the capability to narrow it down to being able to charge one person with the crime. But the impact on Fiona and her family was huge. I mean, here's, here's a quote from her. You know, she felt really terrified that individuals could have hate towards her, hate towards her child as well. And she was really terrified that there could be real life impacts of that hatred that was being shown on the social media platforms. She was, you know, such a great person to interview because she was really eloquent about how she felt and the impact on them and the fact there's this massive gap there between kind of, you know, what is happening online and what could actually be done about it. Then I, I write two chapters in the book where I sp speak about my experience where myself and five other women were harassed by an internet troll who spent quite a number of years emailing us using multiple email accounts. I think he used six at the last count. He impersonated some people via email as well and generally made us all feel extremely um, unsafe. And he was jailed in the end. Um, he spent three years in jail. And it, I wanted to write about my experience because I felt that actually I wasn't too sure about how I felt about the carceral element of this and the fact that, you know, you're looking at, at, at a situation with online harassment. And is there nothing between doing nothing and sending a person to jail? And does, you know, sending a person to prison actually have an impact on their behavior? Does it send a message? Does it rehabilitate people in any way? Um, but I also wanted to share what had happened with myself and the other two women that I spoke to um, about how we felt and about the impact of that on us. And I felt that that was important to share with people, even though it's really hard to talk about these kind of things, I think, publicly. Um, and after the book came out, the uh, man in question was back in court because he'd actually been charged with breaching the bail conditions after he was arrested in, con in connection with harassing us. Um, and I think that really taught me that these stories can and situations like harassment can have a very long tail. And the fact that people are back and forth in court multiple times like we were can be really, really draining on people. And while we were able to an extent deal with that, I can imagine there's other people who wouldn't want to be going through that experience at all. So it made me see the, the gaps that were there. And then another chapter before I move on to my learnings um, was about misinformation. And I mentioned this here because it plays a big part in you know, the current challenges and the future of social media. And you can see here a text that I'm sure a load of you got who are watching here about the, um, you know, the alleged crackdown around um, COVID-19 times. This would have been sent in like very early 2020, you know, probably late March, even mid-March, um, uh, about a hotel allegedly going on lockdown and about different cases of COVID-19. So maybe actually it was probably even before um, the country shut down. And this was a huge part of my job when I worked in the journal with the other editors and writers. We were all constantly observing the sort of content that was being sent to WhatsApp and people were debunking and fact-checking it. And we were watching misinformation 
grow and grow and grow. And in the book, I speak about, I write about that particular experience and what it taught me. And I speak to other experts um, about it, including the deputy editor um, of the journal, Christine Bowen, about what she observed, you know, leading the, the fact checking project. And herself and the other experts all said, this was a real catalyst and a really big moment um, that, that stemmed from the Trump era when there was a, quite a big spread of misinformation and the fake news era, and that they were worried about where things were going to go in the future. So I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. Um, but I thought it was so important to have that chapter about misinformation. And as you can see, Aoife Gallagher is a quote here from the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. And she, at the very last line of this slide, she says, but Gallagher warns that there isn't room for complacency around misinformation. She says, you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. And indeed, her words were absolutely borne out. And these um, clips are all taken from the book. So you can you can find those in the chapter there, too. So just to go to my learnings quickly, the interview learnings that I got from speaking to other people, to go back to that idea of those two tracks, people can be harmed and can be helped by social media. Seems really obvious in a way to say, but I think it's important to hold that in mind, these two quite opposing things, and that that's why we keep going online because of the good stuff. But how do we deal with the negative impacts of social media? Um, a lot of interviewees felt there was very little clarity around how the law or the guardie could help them. Even if there was legislation in place, they might not have known about it. They might not have known they could go to the guardie. And sometimes they went and spoke to the guardie and the guardie at that time in 2020, 2021 didn't really know what to do about what they were coming to them with. So I thought that was a big gap for them at that time. A lot of people felt very alone and not listened to. It's hard to talk about online impacts of behavior um, or, or impacts of behavior online on you in real life because it can be hard to describe that and some people don't maybe understand what you're talking about. Um, and especially if you don't feel like anything can be done and if you feel like the social media platform isn't going to do anything, you're certainly going to feel alone. And I also found that anonymity both helps and harms people. It's really great for people like Eva Martin, who I interviewed, who's a trans woman who really needed that anonymity online. And yet it can also harm people. In fact, it harmed her because she was then a recipient of toxic behavior when she spoke about being a trans woman online. So she was getting both the positives and negatives just by being on the internet, just by being on social media, should I say. Further learnings were that COVID changed the game for misinformation, absolutely, that it just mushroomed really at that time. Um, and also that toxic content on social media is directly impacted by the rules and enforcement on the site. So if you are a social media platform and you're not really enforcing rules around things like suspending people or you don't suspend people, or if you're not really enforcing things like allowing people to block people easily, or the users really feel like that they're not getting enough when they try and complain or flag um, toxic behavior, then those people, those people are going to feel unsafe on your platform. But what you're also doing, if you don't um, block people or sorry, if you don't kind of get rid of people or suspend them or you don't make the rules clear around what's allowed and what isn't on your platform, you're basically allowing people and kind of giving them the green flag in terms of behave however you want. It doesn't really matter because nothing is going to happen about it. And we're seeing a lot of that happening on one particular platform at the moment that I'll mention in a second. But I could really see how the content and how the social, social media sites deal with it really impacts on individuals and can in, in, impact on them in such um, a difficult way. And then I also found that the law and regulation were really catching up. We saw a lot of change around the time I was writing the book and the book came out, um, the OSMR bill, DSA, the Act, things like that. Europe and Ireland was making these changes in terms of trying to you know, come to terms with the impact of social media. Commission the man was set up as well, but those impacts weren't necessarily impacting on people on a day-to-day -day individual basis. So if we move on then just quickly to my experience and the learnings, I touched on these already, I think a bit, but there was a lack of solutions really. Like it felt like there was nothing was going to happen if you're harassed or the person potentially could go to jail. And it felt like there was a big gap there. Um, the key from our case, I think, was there was one perpetrator and they were able to be traced and they were harassing a number of people. And that made that case easier to progress than if you're online and you're harassed by huge number of people and they're not easy to contact. That's the difference between our case and perhaps say Fiona Ryan's experience. The Guardi took the case really seriously from the get go. And I also found that the impact on myself and the other women could be really huge depending on the person. I didn't want to speak for, for everybody, but that's why I interviewed two other, um, two of the other women. And between the three of us, we all were able to talk about the impacts on us. And on some cases, they could be particularly huge and change your relationship with the internet forever really and your inter your relationship with social media in particular so reflecting on all of that and i've given you loads of information there 
what is the impact on the future of social media? Looking at the kind of uh, things that have, have changed between when I brought out the book in April 2023 and now. Um, so the number of social media users is it this is from Statista. It's projected to go to about six billion in a couple of years. At the moment, it's well over five point five. Um, sorry, it's uh, well over five point one billion. So. The numbers aren't projected to go down. We're just going to see more and more people using social media globally. And that, of course, is what the platforms want and what they're working on doing. Um, meanwhile, two owners of the two of the, the most major um, platforms in terms of their reach and their cultural power as well. You've got Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. They're making a huge amount of money. They're billionaires with a lot of power. So they want to keep hold of that power and you know they want to have their say on how their platforms develop. So the users are growing, the amount of money the platforms are making is growing in a really simplistic way. And I wanted to just briefly focus on Twitter for a second, um, which is now called X, but Twitter was taken over by Elon Musk and he became the supreme leader of X and he changed the um, that social media platform almost instantly. You saw rollbacks on trust and safety, which has an impact on moderation for users. And I think anybody who's watching this that's a regular X user or Twitter user can definitively say that they could have given you the results of this particular uh, study in, in, in the University of Southern California and told you that yes, the new Twitter does have a lot more hate on it, that hate speech has significantly increased across all of our feeds. And that is a direct impact from the top person that is running the site, and not because he's going around spreading all the hate, but because he believes in the power of free speech, and he also has certain political ideals, and that filters through how the company is run, and then that has a direct impact on us as users. Um, and then um, I really wanted to draw people's attention to this study that I think people should absolutely read. Um, it's by the Institute of Strategic Dialogue and it highlights what I predicted in the book and most people I think who, who or anybody who's been looking at the subject will have predicted which is that misinformation was going to grow from the COVID era and that we are seeing an absolute rise in mis and disinformation at the moment. Um, some of their findings include that the influence of the far right in Ireland is growing. We see that in the news every day. Tech companies, they say, are failing to enforce community guidelines, which goes back to stuff I discussed in the book. And that emboldens the far right, that the level of the sort of toxic activity is growing. Most of it, according to the study, is on X. And that Telegram is a key platform. Now, we could spend another few hours talking about platforms like Telegram and WhatsApp, which are encrypted and more of a siloed off kind of social media ish uh, platform for people to connect but I think they really draw attention to those those key points in that study and I would really recommend people um, go seek that out they also found that hateful ideologies spread with ease and again that COVID-19 was a catalyst for mis and disinformation and of course we're seeing this all the time at the moment that online discussions fuel offline hostility and violence we literally see this all the time and so just to go to the challenges based off this study and based off the, the kind of learnings that I found through writing uh, my book. And I think none of this is going to be a surprise to, I think anybody really who's been paying attention to the news and who's watching this is that huge, huge challenge constantly is misinformation and disinformation. It is just becoming, um, you know, such a powerful force in the online social media um, experience for users right now. It's really worrying. Um, you know, yesterday I, was on one of the social media platforms that I hadn't been on in a while. And I was served up a video really quickly of three American men talking about the Irish situation with international protection applicants. And the amount of misinformation in that one video presented as fact absolutely blew my mind. And when I sought out their other content, I could see that they were just hoovering up little bits of information and creating a whole new narrative with it. And that was being pushed out to people globally. And that was just one tiny example of what we're seeing online at the moment. Um, the rise of far right actors, AI is going to be a massive challenge, is currently a massive challenge, particularly with elections and particularly with the ability to create disinformation by a video, by an image. It's just one of the biggest things really that is a challenge, I think, globally, uh, not just in social media, but you know, in terms of democracy in general. Um, the impact of concentrated power of one owner if Mark Zuckerberg turns around tomorrow and decides he wants to change radical ways of how Facebook and Instagram and um, WhatsApp work, we as individuals will be directly impacted by a change in his politics or a change in moderation or anything that he decides to change. And he has ultimate power with his company too. And then finally, another challenge is media literacy. And I do think media literacy is a huge amount of work being done to improve it. But because the misinformation has been, been increasing so much, it's even more of a challenge to get to people. 
Um, I'm probably not the only person who's seen friends and, and people they know or acquaintances online um, share messages and share videos and share things online that you're pretty sure they wouldn't have sh you know, shared a couple of years ago, that they would have had a little bit more kind of context searching or they would have been a little bit more cynical and that now they're actually sharing things because of things like, you know, confirmation bias. I think that media literacy um, aspect is a really, a really big challenge. Um, just these headlines highlight, I think, what we're seeing around all of those challenges. Um, warnings about deep, deep fake threats, um, debunked audio praising Irish protesters, a Russian propaganda network. Um, you can read about that on Journal and on the Edmo website as well. And tra having, having to debunk things like AI images that are going around about um, standoffs at, at those very, unfortunately, regular protests. Um, and my final slide, amongst all the information I've given you so far, um, is solutions. And I put a question mark because I'm not going to put myself forward as someone who has the ultimate solution to any of this. But when I think about where the potential solutions might lie, um, based on you know, reading other people's work, thinking about it myself and what I was told in the book, better enforcement all around by, by the platforms. But that does come down to whether the platforms want to enforce certain rules and whether they even want, want to have certain rules in place in, in the first place. Um, if they treasure free speech, then you probably won't have many um, rules in, in place necessarily to be enforced around that. Um, algorithmic control by those platforms, again, you're actually depending on them to not want to amplify certain voices. Fact checking and debunking are massively important. Um, we've got you know great outlets, including my former employer, the journal, fact checking, really, really important stuff. Um, and that is just such a key part, I think, of fighting misinformation. Um, researchers need to be access need to access data because only by accessing the kind of data that the, that the platforms hold about their user base and about the work they do can we see researchers dig into that and then propose more solutions. We need to listen to social media users and we also need to focus on media literacy, both I think on a policy basis, but actually on an individual basis too. Um, I found even myself being out of the newsroom on a day-to-day -day basis. I have to really make sure that I'm keeping up on what's true and what's not. And if I'm doing that as someone who has fact checked things, then I know people who've never fact checked things might not realize that that's something they also have to keep up with. Um, and the Journal Fact Check Knowledge Bank is a really good example um, of where you can look up different things that you might be curious about or you might not have the info on. So I think I've probably gone a little bit over time, but um, it's a big, big topic. And I hope that people found um, that interesting. Um, there's a, a quote from the end of the book, uh, which you can read, but it's basically, it sums up what I said there. And then that's a photograph of my book because it's good to plug social capital. If anybody wants to pick it up, it looks like that on the shelves. So thanks so much for listening to, to me and thanks to the space as well too.